Richard, no. yes, I am going to make you host so you can share your screen and start your presentation. So, Richard, the floor is yours. You are muted. Thank you. Thank you very much and welcome uh, to this session. Um, okay, so let's see if we can plan our session today. The first thing I would like to do is a short uh, uh, grounding practice uh, so that we can align all the levels of our personality, the emotional level, the cognitive, mental level, and the physical one. And then, well, we are going to plunge into the activities we have carried out this year in this wellness uh, seek. So if you agree, then let's start with this brief grounding practice. The idea is uh, I will guide you in a short meditation. But the purpose of this meditation is to think about Silvana's presentation. So uh, the idea will be to focus on our breathing. Then there will be silence and you will think about Silvana's presentation. And after this short practice, maybe you can write something in the chat so that we can explore how Silvana's presentation has a very strong bearing on wellness. Okay, so if you <clears throat> agree, let's sit in a dignified position, focus your attention on the points where you are in contact with the floor and your seat. If you want, you can uh, close your eyes. If not, uh, lower your eyelids and create a soft gaze. And let's concentrate and focus our attention on our breathing. Maybe you feel it in the nostrils. Perhaps you feel it in the chest. Or you might also feel your breathing in the belly. Wherever it is, focus your attention there and feel the temperature of your breathing. Whether it is cool or warm, Let's remain silent for a few seconds. In, out, in breath, out breath. <clears throat> And now let's invite our mind to create in our brain something about Silvana's presentation. Pay attention to how the mind creates these thoughts in your brain. Be aware of how the mind creates these thoughts in the brain, whether you see something, whether you hear something, or whether you feel something in some part of your body, visual or image, auditory image, body sensations, or emotion.
Now breathe deeply again. And very slowly, let's open our eyes and come back to the present moment. Take your time. Okay. So anything you would like to share about Silvana's presentation? Any nuggets that we extracted from this gold mine? Any interesting phrases, words? Um, uh, tres personas han accedido a la sala de espera. ¿Qué hago? Uh, I um, admit. Okay. You have to admit them. Sorry, I can't do that. That's all. I didn't know. <laughs> okay. So the word collaboration, Rosana. Okay. Vivi, she talked about the importance of teachers' well being. Okay. Uh, Nora Lee, impact. Mm. Linda, I liked that she immediately asked us to participate. Romy, uh, can be better teachers through collaboration. Collaboration again. Uh, practices must be impactful. Okay, fine. Uh, great. So you all seem to agree on the word collaboration. So then Ivana's presentation focused on collaboration, on collaborative approaches, which may also include inclusion and diversity, learning from others. Okay, let me admit. Learning from others, freedom to choose what to change. Okay, I felt very happy throughout her plenary. And uh, she talked about all these uh, important uh, aspects of learning and teaching. But the focus seemed to have been on the outside. So you collaborate, you interact with other colleagues, other teachers. Now, in our well being SIG, the focus is on ourselves because we do have lots of sub-personalities. We do have lots of voices that might help us to create this collaborative spirit. So she also uh, talked about collaboration as the exploration of our beliefs. So when we are interacting with uh, uh, other colleagues, we explore our beliefs about learning and our beliefs about uh, teaching. And the exploration of beliefs might become rather dangerous. It is a kind of dangerous ground to tread. Why do you think that the exploration of beliefs might create kind of resistance in some of our colleagues? and also in ourselves. Any ideas? You can write in the chat if you want. Mm. No ideas, okay. It's often hard to change indeed, Linda. And why is it often hard to change? Well, this has to do with the brain. Remember, we have three brains or in a very simplistic way, I always teach the brain as the fist. So this, this part is the brain stem. Mm -hmm. This one here would be the cerebellum. This very primitive brain is what they call reptilian. Then we develop this one, which neurologists call the a mammalian or limbic brain, very important brain in learning because it is the seat of emotion. Here we have the mighty amygdala and the hippocampus. And then we develop the, this one, the neocortex. Now, uh, definitely when we talk about collaboration, inclusion, diversity, collaborative approaches, innovating together, blah, 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 blah. 
we are all the time activating the neocortex. What we need to do is to ask the mammalian brain, the reptilian, the cerebellum, understand for help. Now, the question goes back to what Linda wrote. It is difficult uh, to change. And Analia wrote, it makes us feel insecure. Definitely. Beliefs are closely associated with our identity, who we are. No, 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 I teach using a lot of grammar. Grammar is the best. No, 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 the approach is vocabulary. Oh, no, in pronunciation is very important for me. No, forget about pronunciation. English is a lingua franca. Speak like a Latin guy, speak like, an, like a Porteño, no problem. No, that's horrible. My phonetics teacher will stir in the grave. She, Mr. Zingraf, Mrs. Fioravanti will kill us. Okay, what is going on here? The problem is what now psychologists call cognitive entrenchment, atrincheramiento cognitivo. So then we become soldiers defending our beliefs. This is also called a cognitive fusion. So we become what we believe in. And that is very, very dangerous, but very, very natural because we all have fond memories for prof of Professor Zinkraf. Yes, Linda. Um, we all have the same brain. So then going back to this, maybe the neocortex says we need to change. We need to accept English as a lingua franca. Don't worry about your pronunciation, but if the limbic, if the amygdala and all the other areas of the brain, of this brain are activated, they will say no. So then what we learned with Silvana is very important, but the focus was on what to do with other people. I believe that our invitation, our suggestion from the wellness group is to start working with contemplative practices. What do we mean by contemplative practices? We can choose either mindfulness, creative visualization, transcendental meditation, any practice that allows for reflection and helps us to really understand the structure of subjective experience. So it helps us to understand how the mind creates reality in our brain, how the mind creates the map of the territory. Okay, so this is what we learned uh, uh, in Silvana's interesting talk. Then she mentioned somebody that um, uh, talked about uh, the meditation practice being warm and fuzzy being a warm and fuzzy experience. Well, probably this guy attended a Mac mindfulness session, Mac mindfulness with music, balloons and whatever. I must tell you that the practice of mindfulness is a very strict discipline and it forces us to leave our comfort zone. This is what Silvana talked about, disturbing the status quo, definitely. All reflective practices, all introspective practices disturb the status quo. It makes us explore areas that we are not familiar with and that they can be very, very important in our teaching learning experience. Okay, so let's start with a, a short summary. Oh my God, it's, uh, it's rather late, uh, of, of what we did. Uh, uh, in the SIG group. So do I have to share that? Uh, um, Richard, yes, you will have to share a screen. You're the host. So your uh, okay. presentation, you share it yourself. Uh, OK, OK. Let me see. OK. So. Mm -hmm. Let's see here. Okay. 
Mm -hmm. And I have to share. Okay. Mm. Can you see this? Not no. yet. You're still not sharing screen. Okay. How do I share this? Uh, mm -hmm. Do you want to enable me, Rami? Uh, yes, uh, yes, yes, I will. Mm -hmm. Okay, please, because I don't know how to share. Wait, wait, wait. Okay, so the 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 first. Um, um, I can't. Area we, you can't because Ricardo is the host. He has to make ah. it the host. Okay. So make me a host, Richard, but that's okay. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Mm. But what do I have to click on? Okay. I will help you. So uh, you go to the list of participants. Yes, where Nora Lee is. Yes. You will get a, a, a little menu that says more. You click on there. And one of the options you will get is make host. Uh -huh. And so you click on that, you accept, because it will say, do you want, are you sure you want to make Telcenter or Norali Karamanian a host? So you do, and she will yes. be the host and she can share the screen. I always do this in my sessions, but what's going on here? Okay. Oh my God, I can't do this. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, if not, you click on share screen and you choose the window you want to share, which is probably your open PowerPoint. And you click ah, okay, that okay. and you share the, the screen yourself. Oh, okay, okay. Yes, yes. Sorry. It was the okay. This one here. Uh huh. Okay, let me shift and talk to you. There, you there. That's Great. it. Yes. Okay. Well, very interesting. Admit it, Nines. Very interesting experience. While I was doing this, I heard my pepito saying richard please this is a sh come on it is grace come on so notice how my mind created anxiety it was mainly through auditory images not visual i didn't see anything i just listened to this uh, voice saying come on you are a professional guy what are they gonna think okay so here we have uh, the first area we explored, can you all see this? Well, it, it, which I suggest you, you can uh, watch. These are videos and we explored this video by Dr. Alan Watkins, being brilliant every single day, parts one and two. And uh, what we learn in this video, uh, Dr. Alan Watkins is a neurologist. I was lucky enough to attend one of his trainings in Cambridge at the Mindful uh, Summer School. And um, he talks about the fact that we, and let me translate it into our teaching experience, we are all the time focused on results. We want our students to learn. We want to have, uh, to have successful students. Now, what the results will spring from what we do in, in the classroom. And uh, mainly our uh, training practice is focused on what we do. We all want recipes, how to teach uh, reported speech, how to teach conditional sentences. But uh, Dr. Watkins says that what we do depends on what we think. That is to say, it depends on our thoughts. And please remember that thoughts are nothing else than visual images, auditory images that trigger body sensations. 
that is to say, emotions. Now, he insists on the fact that we need to raise awareness of how the brain creates reality. He insists on the fact that we need to raise awareness of how we create our subjective experience. He moves uh, even deeper and talks about feelings and emotions. He makes a distinction, but well, it's not important here. And he finally says that the most important thing uh, in order to be brilliant every single day, to be a brilliant coach, a brilliant teacher, depends on our physiology. And here he speaks about breathing. So he insists on the fact that breathing, our breathing should be smooth, coherent, regular, and soft. It's very, very, very smooth. He says that the breathing activates electricity in the heart. This is the um, reticular act, the, what he calls the, um, the, the uh, sorry, the uh, heart activity that is mainly electrical, produced by, by our thoughts. And this electricity travels to the brain when the electricity is at a very high beta level maybe 30, 40 cycles per second. What happened to me when I couldn't show you the, the slides here, um, he says that this high beta electrical brain waves activates neurocircuits in the brain that send the electricity to the second brain, that is to say to the limbic brain, mammalian, to the... Uh, um, thalamus the thalamus is that like the switchboard operator says oh this is too high there is danger so if the electricity is very high as i said before the uh, thalamus sends the electrical brain waves to the amygdala the amygdala immediately wakes up and says danger we are going to be eaten by a lion and so it prepares us to fight to fly or flee, the, the three Fs, fight, flee, or escape, or flight, and freeze, but not to think rationally. The amygdala sends the electricity to the suprarenals, and the suprarenals release cortisol and adrenaline, which are good hormones or neurotransmitters for action, but not to give a class or to think rationally. So he says, please change your breathing patterns. Maybe you can also add some auditory input to help you. I'm breathing in, I'm breathing out. You can also add some mantras. I'm okay, this is okay, I'm in control. Whatever you come up with, it doesn't matter. The, the words don't matter. The words should be something that you like because the words, language creates the electricity. So then, when the electrical brain waves are smooth, rhythmic, and coherent, the um, neuro uh, circuits begin to release these positive neurotransmitters, dopamine, serotonin, uh, oxytocin, and endorphins. Uh, so this, this was then uh, the practice we uh, did in our wellness uh, SIG, uh, but as, as you know, this requires discipline, this requires commitment and engagement. This is not a, what the guy called a warm and fuzzy practice. So you have the link, you, have, you can Google uh, Dr. Alan Watkins and you will find lots of interesting videos that you may uh, practice and then after practicing yourself, share with your students. Remember that the first thing is to see whether these practices resonate with us. If they do, and after intensive practice, we can share it with other people, not before. This is not a magic recipe. It requires, as I said before, engagement, commitment, and discipline. All right, the other area we, uh, practice, the other area we focus on was 
uh, Dr. Mark Williams. These are the mindful session. We listened to podcasts and we did the mindfulness practice. And in these sessions, we learned that we can then uh, decode, we can deconstruct our subjective experience. And as I said before, the main ingredients the mind uses to create reality in the brain are visual images, internal dialogue, and body sensations, or emotions, which Mark Williams and uh, lots of neuroscientists define as energy in motion, emotion, energy in motion. When we are in control of this, we can develop uh, what he calls um, focus, that is, a, we, we develop concentration, clarity. Hmm, we say, okay, when I was nervous at the beginning of the presentation because I couldn't share the, 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 the slides, I heard toxic voices in this area of my, of my a, a visual or auditory domain. Hmm. And so then you develop awareness of how you create these visual auditory uh, images that always trigger body sensations. And the other point is the development of equanimity. So the three more ingredients in the practice of mindfulness would be then focus or concentration, you train the brain to focus little by little on something, maybe your breathing, maybe a mantra, maybe a mantra, maybe uh, something visual that you see, that is the focus. Then clarity, you say, mm, I have noises here, mm, I have to go to the supermarket. Oh, how did this thought go into the supermarket up here. Did I see something? Did I hear? Did I feel? And then uh, by recognizing, saying, okay, going to the supermarket will be done later on. Now let's come back to the breathing. Let's come back to the mantra to develop the muscle. This idea some people have that the mind, you have a blank mind, well, I must tell you that this is not for us ordinary beings. We are mortals, maybe for monks or, or people who are in a monastery. But for the rest of us, we will always have to deal with distractions. And distractions are very positive because they allow us to create the muscle, the mental muscle of concentration. And so then focus, mental clarity as to how your subjective experience is created. And finally, uh, equanimity, to, uh, to have this calmness, to accept things, to dissociate from what you are feeling, not to develop this, what we called before, uh, cognitive entrenchment. Okay, uh, so then Dr. William, Dr. Mark Williams, the other one was, uh, um, Alan Watkins, and uh, uh, our next uh, focus of concentration was uh, Dr. Ellen Langer, uh, which many people in meditation call Langerian mindfulness. You know that um, experts say that the father of uh, mindfulness is John Kabat-Zinn. So we can say that Ellen is the mother of mindfulness. And in her book, uh, Mindfulness, she uh, uh, works on formal meditation, but she insists on the fact that we can be mindful doing everyday things. So here you have uh, the formal meditation and then this informal meditation, when we are cleaning the bathroom or when we are gardening or cooking or washing the dishes. The idea is to focus on the activity. And in that way, we develop this focus, this clarity, and this equanimity. 
the interesting thing for us uh, as educators is to help our students, our coaches, our mentorees, I don't know what you call them, uh, to help them deal with boredom. I believe that this is an area that has been neglected in our experience. I don't know why. I don't teach uh, teenagers now. I am more focused on corporate training. And in my sessions, we always have boring things to focus on and to explore how this boredom is created in the brain and to find ways to make it interesting. It is mainly carried out, according to my students, through internal dialogue. So for example, uh, I don't know, an accountant that has to do some boring task might say this is interesting, can create words and phrases. There are lots of people coming in, okay. So then many um, through words, we create uh, interest, something that we like. So then uh, Lang uh, Dr. Ellen Langer insists, engage in boring activities and do them mindfulness, mindfully. I believe this is very important. Now, one of the things uh, we learn in our practice with um, Dr. Langer, we read the book and watched some videos, is that she helps us defamiliarize the ordinary. It is what in poetry we also do. Poetry helps us to defamiliarize language. Mm? For example, in a phrase like, uh, an hour ago, remember this, this famous phrase, and in some of, in a poem, it appears as a grief ago. A grief ago. Wow, what a powerful, we wake up. So this is what she insists on. Defamiliarize the ordinary. Find uh, something interesting in washing the dishes. Pay attention to uh, the detergent you are, you are using, the color, the smell, I don't know, but defamiliarize it. And she insists that this helps us to awaken our dormant senses. And here I remember Blake, who speaks of the mind forged manacles in his beautiful poem, London. And uh, we become enslaved by the mind. When we practice this informal meditation, we go to the body. We act, uh, wake up our five senses. And that is a wonderful experience. In my practice, I use a lot of internal dialogue. So I ask myself, well, I am gardening. What is different in this leaf? Uh, how many colors do I see here? Uh, I engage in an internal dialogue because if not, my mind focusing on, focuses on other things. And the interesting thing about this, um, the poem, remember, I, have, have you read this poem uh, Blake, by, by Blake? Uh, he says, um, just I'll read, uh, let me look for it in stanza number, Let's see this one. This is in the Songs of Experience. He says, if then you can uh, look it up. And he says that um, in stanza number, number two, he says, in every cry of every man, in every infant's cry of fear, in every voice, in every band, the mind forged manacles I hear. So notice the, the emphasis, the mind is creating reality in the speaker's mind, in the speaker's brain through auditory images. It's all cry, uh, a cry of fear, every voice here. And in the third stanza, he says, how the chimney sweepers cry, every blackening church appalls. And the hapless soldiers high, sigh, sorry, the, the hapless soldier sigh runs in blood down palace wall. And if you look at the beginning of each line, how 
every and runs. If you read the first letters, you read here. Interesting, fantastic, amazing. So then it is the auditory input that creates this reality. That's why we need to be very aware of our internal dialogue, of what we tell ourselves. All right, now the next section in connection with voice, we started working on the voice dialogue technique developed by Dr. Hal Stone and Sidra Stone. And these are psychologists, psychiatrists who develop this technique to explore the different selves that we have, the different voices. Now, what about the practical application of this technique in us teachers and st students? Well, the idea is to befriend the inner critic. So the idea is then, uh, what I told you, what happened at the beginning of my presentation when I didn't know how to go about it, I heard my critic saying, come on, this is impossible. You are not a professional. What are you doing? What will these people think? So this voice, very, very strong, uh, colored my emotional mood. What I did is I said, okay, critic, thank you for coming, but please silent, be silent because now I have to work it out. So I established rapport. Remember that the voice, that creates anxiety is an emotion and it is energy in motion. The best thing to manage this is to vent this emotion, to vent this energy, to let, to let, come it, let it out through the internal dialogue. So you, in my case, I told you that the domain, the location was here not here, not in, not, I didn't hear my voice uh, in the right area here. It was here on the back. I talked to it. You, you, you know me and some of you know that I have a Pepito. Uh, I created a character. This one, dun, 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 dun. So Pepito appears and says, come on, you're not good. You're not, okay, thank you for coming. I listen to Pepito, I take notes, you need to improve your accent, you need to improve your pronunciation, you need to improve your reading. Okay, thank you. Well, now stop it, go to another place, I will do this. So I feel much more relieved because I, I accepted my, he has, remember that the inner critic has always what we come here, the positive intention. This is very important to make uh, your students aware of. Whenever they are listening to a toxic voice, we call it toxic. Well, the voice has a positive intention. It wants us to be the very best. It wants us to be brilliant, the best teachers, to have the best accent, to have the best vocabulary, to have the best teaching techniques. So this is a very important point to be aware of, to explore the positive intention to befriend the inner critic. And this leads us to what we did um, with the group, Dr. Nathaniel Brandon's The Psychology of Self-Esteem. So the voice, the Pepito, has this uh, uh, insistence, is so insistent on being the best because he is focused on the domain of doing. Dr. Brandon, he has wonderful books and videos, says that self-esteem, our opinion of ourselves, has two main pillars. One is self-worth and the other is self-efficacy. Now, self-worth is the domain of being and self-efficacy, the domain of doing. So then what I see in learning, teaching, learning practices, what, we, what I hear in workshops is that we are all the time focused on the domain of doing, on the roles, on the recipes. It's okay 
We all need recipes, but very few people speak of being. What we must make our students aware of is that we as educators, we work only in the domain of self-efficacy. That is to say, we work in the domain of doing. We don't touch being. They are perfect as they are. They are perfect as human beings. We are human beings, not human doings. So then in my practice, in companies, I all, you know, um, teaching adult students is challenging because they have to give presentations in English and is it this when they have to do this in English, it erodes their self-esteem. When self-esteem is eroded, you become aggressive because you activate the amygdala. So I tell them, listen, you are perfect as you are. I do not uh, work in the domain of being. I will only give you some help in the domain of doing, so I will help you to speak better, to get, have more vocabulary, to have better structures. That's why we never, I never use the verb to be. But most students say, I am not good at, I am bad at, which is very toxic because the reptilian, cerebellum, stem, mammalian brain say, yes, yes, you are, you are like that. Nothing can be done. The domain of being is, uh, cannot be touched. We are perfect as we are. We need to use verbs that are on the level of behavior. So then instead of saying, I am, I am, I am bad, this one, I am not good at writing, I, I write badly. Or writing is a skill I want to improve. Um, pay attention to the way your students, your coaches, your mentorees speak. Uh, usually when uh, you ask them to identify yourself, hello, okay, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, thank you. My name is, uh, I am a teacher of English as a foreign language. No. I work as a teacher of English, as a, but I am a human being. Some people think that this is a superficial distinction, which is not. It is very profound. So we need to help our students, our coaches, uh, create this uh, well being by separating doing from being, by separating self efficacy from self worth. Okay, and, uh, oh yes, we have to finish. Uh, no, you can go. So, just some uh, food for thought. The first thing we learn in our wellness SIG is that all learning is state dependent. So then, uh, how well we learn depends on the emotional state we are in at a specific moment. And remember what uh, we saw here at the beginning, here. This state is created by mainly by this physiology, by our breathing. We need to be aware of all these levels, not just focus on behavior. We need to go deeper into ourselves and say how I feel, where it is the emotion located, how can I improve this, okay, by breathing rhythmically, coherently, uh, smoothly. Okay. The next thing we learned is that the best way to get our coaches, our students in a peak learning state is to enter that state yourself. So I always say, okay, we're going to work on this presentation. This is fantastic. Oh, yes, you will have to use a lot of conditionals, type three. I think you will have an erotic relationship with conditionals. Be careful with your wife. She will become jealous and they start laughing. So create this humor in the class. Um, so then I do this. I am going to have a great, great, great time uh, teaching you this conditional type three that you will use in your presentation. The other important thing we learned is that there are no unresourceful people. So this is the domain of being, only unresourceful states. This is the domain of doing, not being. I am not in a 
in a, in a resourceful state to learn today or oh, what's going on. Begin to explore what Dr. Williams called the emotion, the feeling tone, which is something we don't have to dive in now, but it's very, very important. If you can Google feeling tone. Okay. The next thing we worked on was that in order to be in a particular state, there is something that we have to do mentally and something that we have to do physically. So when something mentally, okay, I have to do this uh, uh, coaching session and it is challenging because my coach is a very tough guy. And so I begin to create mentally, to create mentally through my internal dialogue, I am going to be of service. I will help somebody to, I create some mantras, auditory input that activate uh, neural circuits in the brain through the brain waves that are more or less at the alpha level, seven to 14 cycles per second. So I uh, do something mentally, auditorily, maybe I see something. When we focus on the mental activity, remember it is visual and auditory. And then something that we do physically, and that has to do with our breathing. So I begin, I begin to breathe uh, slowly. I develop some anchors. For example, I do this. You didn't see me, but throughout the presentation, I was like this. This is my meditation posture, because in general, I have the tendency to rush, to speak very quickly, and to do many things at the same time. And that is dysfunctional. So in order that when I do this, I am in a more meditative mood so I can breathe, I can smile. I, I am not uh, uh, pushing you into doing things. So develop ankles. Remember ankles can be visual, auditory or kinesthetic, very powerful. Then be aware or be mindful of the state. We, are, we must be, be aware of the state we are in whenever we go into a teaching learning interaction. And here comes what we must uh, talk about the uh, feeling tone. Probably, for example, it happens sometimes I have a problem with uh, some uh, managers. And when I enter the other meeting, I have not cleaned that tone. So it's very important before you enter, before you go into another classroom, take a pause. Uh, be mindful and say, what do I feel? Oh, this guy was very aggressive. I feel very angry. Ah, I feel angry. So you label the emotion. Where, where is the emotion located here? Mm, my solar plate. Okay, I need to do some. Come on, emotion. So you interact with emotion. You label it. Remember, label to tame. When you label things, you tame things because you are activating the neocortex. And then yes, once you have cleaned that emotion, once you have established a more proactive, a more ecological, a more resourceful uh, emotional state, you are ready for the next class. And the last point was that in any human interaction, the person most committed to their state would influence the other person. Okay, then, I would like to share with you, you know, this book by our dear colleague, Cristina Banfish. You will, we will listen to her. Uh, so, uh, El aprendizaje de idiomas. Y ella lo titula, ¿Cómo habla la mente? ¿Cómo habla? Very interesting. Auditory input. And then, in one chapter, this is uh, chapter nine in her book. Yes, in this book, uh, she quotes some uh, experts about, I haven't read these people, Phillips and Sakai, I think it's called Sakai. And they say, knowing where language is supported in the human brain is just one step on the path of finding what are the special properties of those brain regions that make language possible. An important challenge for coming years 
will be to find whether the brain areas that are implicated in language studies turn out to have distinctive properties at the neural, le neuro neuro neural level that allow them to explain the special properties of human language. So notice here the effect, the focus is on understanding how the brain works. That's why we need to become more acquainted with brain activity. And then she quotes another, two other experts, Smith and Simply, I think it's called. And they say the human mind is not an unstructured re-entity. It is not an unstructured entity, but consists of components which can be distinguished by their functional properties. And this is what we do at the wellness sick. What we do is this, we focus on the structured entity of the brain and we focus on the components which can be distinguished by their functional properties. That is to say, our subjective experience. Uh, this is the only reference to the brain in this book. We will see what Christina tells us this afternoon. Okay, well, I, I believe that's all. Um, we don't have time to do a little meditation practice, but um, I don't know if there are questions or something. If you have any uh, questions for Richard, please um, type, in, type them in the chat box. If not, we can all go and enjoy our lunch. Our lunch. And we can, we can have lunch mindfully. Actually. But not, I mean, not the whole lunch, just one, let's say 50, 50 seconds. Don't exaggerate. Just 50 seconds, taste, enjoy the lunch, etc., etc. So there are no questions. There are no questions. Everybody is very thankful, grateful. I am also very grateful for this Thank presentation. You. And uh, just a little reminder before we go, we, we log out you know, for lunch. Uh, remember, the, the next um, set of concurrent sessions is starting at 1.30. Yes, we have the Good Practice Showcase. There will be a choice of three sessions. And at 2.30, we have Christina Bamfi's closing plenary. So remember to join us back in almost, no, a little bit longer than one hour. Thank you very much and see Thank you later. You. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Take care. Bye.